Welcome to another very special bonus edition of the Paul Ryder Tapes. This episode features our friend, the legend that is the bass player with the Stone Roses and also formerly of Primal Scream. It is the one and only lovely, lovely Manny. And this interview was recorded shortly before the tragic death of Manny's wife, Imelda. So, have I told you what all this is about? Did I? Did I? No, go on. Surprise me. You know me. I'll, I'll mix shit up as I go along. I'm good at it. So, in the months leading, you know, me and Paul broke up seven years ago. Yeah. We ended up being really good friends, actually. So much so that the last four, five months of his life, we were working on a podcast. Well, not just a podcast. The idea was that he would. He wanted, always wanted to do a book, but I knew he was yeah. never going to get round to it. So I said, why don't you do a podcast with me? Talk to me your life story. Talk it all yeah. out. And then we'll make it into a book. And then we can <clears> film <throat> it and we'll just do a whole, like, your whole life story. I said, but yeah. it's got to be all the shit as well as the good stuff. Like, oh, absolutely. No, no the, I didn't, yeah. The mental breakdowns, the addictions, the in- cheating, yeah, yeah. And all that stuff. Obviously, as well as all the Monday stuff too. So he yeah. literally, he'd come over here like every Sunday for a couple of hours. And he could only do about an hour or two at a time because it was hard work. And we literally finished getting his story down 12 days before he died. Unbelievable, that. And it, I, I, I'm just saying to him, I, know, but I just can't fucking believe he ain't about. It's just, been, it's just, there's that many people gone in this short space of fucking time. All lockdown and all that, it's just, it just doesn't seem real somehow, you know. I know, I know. Terrible, isn't it? But it was weird, it was like, it when when Amelia told me that he died in the night, I just said, oh, I, I knew, I knew. It was yeah. like, whoa, how did I know that? Like, it, it was yeah, really strange, weird, and some... I wonder if he knew as well, I don't know. Anyway, he, he got his story down, and all the all the gory detail, and all the stuff he's not talked about before. Brilliant. So it's really good, and the, the idea was that, at the time, was that we'd bring other people in who'd rub shoulders with him to get their perspective yeah, yeah. on things too. And obviously, you were one of the people on the list. Um, yeah. He talks a lot. Obviously, huge, huge respect and love for you as, um, you know. I was saying, as, as, saying as, back, you know, it, 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 it was always my favourite bass player. Him, him and Andy Rope were my two favourite bass players in Manchester. Oh. Do you remember the very first time you, you met him and, and came across him? Well, it probably would have been uh, either the round the boardwalk or uh, or the ass. You know, uh, I was always conscious of, of him uh, as a band. Really, Robbers was a real fan of him. Uh, in a lot of ways, sometimes it'd be like you'd wish he was in the Happy Mondays and not in the Stone Roses in, in in a weird kind of way. You know, it just uh, it, it, they, they were, it appealed to me a lot. Uh, the, the look of him and. They like the bastardised funk that they were trying to uh, trying to knock together and stuff like that. And uh, you can and on the art you can say there was never any kind of rivalry ever in Manchester. We always like got a like house on fire and there was a a mutual respect right there from the get go, you know. And it's and that lasted all the way through it all, you know. Yeah, that's one thing that I that really astounds me with all of this. That like there's so much love between all of the Manchester band. There's no like Oh, way better than them, way but like there's none of that at all, and that that's that's really oh, beautiful, that's, isn't it? It was good, you know, because yeah. it's just like you know we're all having a crack at it, uh, or making it up as you're going along, kind of thing. And you, you know, when when you're uh, you can be happy for somebody else's success, you know. I think that's a a heartwarming thing to be able to punt that out, you know. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember when you first heard about them? When like when you first came across them or met them? Yeah, well, that would have been you know, like uh, in club nights and stuff like that, or maybe see him at gigs and stuff like that. And uh, like, so I always got on well with Paul. Uh, I'd always had a, a real admiration for his style of, of playing and stuff. Uh, he was quite, he was a funky guy, you know, even though the Mondays weren't what you would call like funky music, same as the Smiths weren't, but Andy Rock had that funk in him as well. You know, there's a bit of Boots and Collins, a bit of all sorts of stuff going on in there. And I had a real admiration for the man, and he was was just a proper stand-up guy as a person, you know. He 
you talked a lot about um, that pivotal time when both of you did Top of the Pops. Can you tell me about oh, that? Was a, that was a funny day. We was, we was going to do a bit of swapping and changing, weren't we? So I think I was going to go and play the drums for the Mondays and someone was going to come do something for the, play the bass for the Roses and, and so on. Never quite got round to it, but uh, it would have been a, a, a good jolly jape by the uh, the man contingent. I don't think the fucking BBC knew what the fuck was going on that day. There was a lot of uh, brandy quaffed, uh, other substances ingested, you know, and uh, it was, uh, I remember it being such a main event, you know, the people, there was like a big fucking party in Dry Bar, and it was like the two, here's the Manchester's arrived, the, the, the Manchester thing, had got had gained national prominence, you know. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. And it was a, it was a very very special time, and it's it's good to see your buds doing well, you know. Was there any rivalry at that point though, because you were both vying for a chart position? I don't think there was rivalry of, of, of any sort. We, we was always like myself and Ian. Fucking love love Paul, love the Mondays, I love them all as guys, you know, and. Uh, no, there was never, oh, they've one, one chart place above us or anything else. You know, none of that going down. That's, uh, that was never on anyone's agenda, that. Probably ought to smash to fucking even think about that that way, you know. Did you ever play gigs together? I don't re ever remember them being... No, I don't think we did, you know. Which is, uh, most of the pity that we didn't, because that would have been uh, yeah. an outrageous uh, couple in that one. You know, I know that I know the Mondays have played uh, when they did Ellen Road and they played to all of the bands like the Lars or the Farm and stuff like that were on. We never kind of ever seemed to get embroiled in anything like that. It was probably the least hard working band in show business of Stone Roses, you know. Maybe we should have got out and played more and it would have been uh, something to write home about a Roses and Mondays team, it would have been brilliant, you know. Yeah, but you, the Roses really did it right, though, didn't they? I mean, you know, we compared... Well, we did it right by by not ju jumping through hoops, basically, and uh, do things on on your own terms as much as you as you can, kind of thing. I think we should, we, we could have gone out and we could have worked a, a lot harder, but we're intrinsically a bunch of lazy fuckers, you know. <laughs> but you also had many years in Primal Scream as well, didn't you? Yeah, well, I was out of the frying pan into the fire, I think I had... Two weeks holiday, and then there was, and then I was off for sixteen years with the scream, and uh, a lot of parallels with the primals and the, and the Mondays. You know, uh, fucking great band, absolutely berserk personalities at work. Yeah. It's all added up to just absolute carnage on uh, thousands of occasions, but uh, good controlled carnage. <laughs> what do you think it was that? gave the Mondays the magic that they had, or that they have? Well, just, you know, when you look at the the, the kid, the kid, the background that they've come from, and there was just, there's sometimes there's, a, there's an ingredient that's unquantifiable uh, when it comes to musicians and the magic they can create, just from simply being in a room together, you know, uh, no one's been to no music school. Everyone's flying by the seat of the pants. You know, you, you you really are inventing the rules as you go along in in, in many ways. And I think the Mondays and the Roses have both had a, a modicum of that going on. So, sort of like writing history in, in your own image or how you'd like to, how you'd like to, to run it, you know. Yeah. So do you remember any nights out Involving Paul or the Mondays, do you remember it? Oh. <laughs> very it ended up being a bit messy, you know. Uh, we used to see him all the time around the ass and around and when you got the kitchen and stuff like that, all in dry bar. And they're always just good lads to sit down, you'd always sit down and have a, have a few beers with him and uh, a few spliffs, good chin wag, you know. Uh, it was always a pleasure to be in Paul's company. You know, even at certain points when he'd come in with have a Sunday dinner at, at my house with him and, and stuff like that. And uh, it was always a pleasure, real pleasure to be in his company. And uh, got like a house on fire, you know, the, the great respect I had for him, I'm sure he had the same for me as well, you know. And uh, Ian Brown I always considered Paul to be a very, very true friend of his as well, you know. And uh, just spent good times in his company. And it's, it's very hard to to see that it won't happen again, innit? 
It's unfair. Gross, grossly unfair. It is. Do you remember when you came over to LA to visit? Can you talk about that? Yeah, it was great up to Calabasas Canyon, man. Yeah, it was really, really cool. I enjoyed your little house there. And I was sitting out by the pool there, having a few beers and I remember sitting in having a little little twang on his base in the in the house and stuff like that. It was just a, it was a really nice hangout, you know. You had a good life for yourselves there and uh, it was nice to have been invited and, and been part of it and that day by the beach was beautiful and Yeah, it was it, it was great and there was a really good like expat scene around Los Angeles. There's a lot of, I've got a lot of friends there. But it's nice where you chose to live, Calabasas, and get out of Hollywood and it's nice up there, you know, you probably hear the coyotes in the night and what have you, you know. It's a nice a good move that. Actually, that's another thing that we have to talk about. You you were really generous and kind when Chico was ill, I remember. How yes. kind you were. And you um you DJ'd at the at the fundraiser that we had. Yes, I did, yeah, that's right. Can yeah. you talk about that? Do you remember that night? Well, do you know what? It's any of the Mondays kids would be treating like the, your own kids, you know, if uh, if someone needs a helping hand, then I'd be more than eager and willing to to pitch in and do whatever is necessary to to make something happen, you know. I, that was a, a, a good little event. I, I remember really enjoying that, and it's good to have people out. And then when we came and did the Coachella thing, and, it, and uh, God, he was poorly cheek. I want, he was very, very weak. Uh, it's like, it's... it's Heartbreaking in a lot of ways. Anyway, just, you know, uh, don't don't want to see a child like go through that. You know, when you're a parent, it's it. Did all your kids, you know, even if they're yours and Paul's, they, 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 you've got to still look at them like they're children, and you've got to love them, aren't you? And do what you can to protect them. So uh, it, it was very very ill, wasn't it, at Coachella, and it was. Uh, I'm glad I'm glad to see he's uh, he's turned that corner, you know, and. Uh, He's kicked it, you know. I remember him uh, being at the side of the stage and Ian gave him some bells, like bells. Yeah, 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 sticks. just like the jingle bell thing. Yeah, yeah, that was so nice. Yeah. That, that was, was a nice, proper, mem proper brilliant memory, that. that was yeah, nice. well, do you know, like I said, we love the kids. Uh, you know, your kids are as good as ours, they all get treated with the same respect, mate, you know. That's so nice. What did you feel? How, did, presumably, you're aware of the whole, like, Sean and Paul tensions and rivalries did you ever witness any of that at all I can't say as a i really saw it in action i think there's a lot of that was done in closed doors and then and, and behind the scenes and stuff like that listen look look at half the bands where there's been brothers in bands over the history there's there is a tension and a rivalry there and i suppose sometimes that's what makes the edge as cutting as as it is, you know, it's like I'll fucking show you da, 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 this that, and the other, and you know, all these points to be proven. And I don't know, it's everyone wants to be the fucking king of their castle, don't they? You know, and uh, <laughs> it, it, unfortunately, if you look at any any band with brothers in like the Kinks or Oasis or whoever, it's it's always their sibling rivalry. Yeah, but do you think that it that helped to add to the magic? I think it does because it, it it could serve to sharpen you up and, and, and get a, a, a better level of performance when you're like trying to stick it to your brother, right, to show him what you've got, you know. I couldn't I couldn't ever envisage being in a band with my brother. We'd end up fucking strangling each other, you know, as much as we love each other, but uh, not on a professional level, unfortunately. Do you remember any particular Monday's gigs that stuck in your mind? I remember the the, the GMX thing was about her. Huh? I remember we went to uh, there was another one where it was, maybe it was King George's Hall in Blackburn really late on, and Sean had really had substance problems at that point in time, and I think the Stereo MCs were opening up for him, and that was a pretty magical uh, gig. And then beyond the Mondays into Black Grape and stuff like that, the, 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 you know, used to used to see them a lot around the town and stuff. But it was always like uh, an electricity at Monday's gigs, you know, uh, and a great proper good crowd of people uh, used to show up at them as well, you know. It was guaranteed uh, fun, without a doubt. I can't believe that the, the Roses and the Mondays never did a, a gig together. That would have been legendary, wouldn't it? 
it would have been legendary and it's, and it's sad that it never came to fruition that you know uh, maybe we should have got out of bed a bit more or so and made something happen you know so in terms of Paul and your relationship with Paul like it did did you keep in touch over the years? Like, how how kind of? Well, I, I suppose when you'd see each other, you just pick up where you left off last time. You know, and uh, it's not like ne never on uh, on phone call terms. I'd, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd message him a few times, and I said, if you come to England, I'm meeting. We're going to have a pint or something like that. Yeah. But I think it was more born of uh, a, an admiration for his. Uh, his playing style and you know, I liked him as a guy, you know. Well, that was mutual. Yeah, that was, a, that was mutual, inc it? Incredible bass player. You know, let it never be unsaid that he was fucking shit up, man. His craft, very, very good at it. Yeah. Talk to me about your Sunday dinners. Well, it said to us, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get a Sunday dinner on when you come over. So we did. I'm sure we might have had Gaz Whelan over here separately as well. So, no. My missus does knock a good Sunday dinner together and, and it's been nice to have people around. You know, it's getting a bit long in the tooth now for going out clubbing, so I'd rather sit down with a big plate full of scoff in front of me, you know, and have some good good company around and a couple of beers, a couple of glasses of wine. So Here's another thing that, uh, uh, with Paul. Imelda's mother's surname, uh, before she was married, she's from around Little Alton, Ryder. And... <laughs> And Paul always used to say about Imelda, fucking hell, you remind me of my daughter or something like that. You know, we often thought, could there have been a tenuous link family-wise there? Ryder with a Y is a really unusual thing. Yeah, I know, it's exactly, that, that's it, you know. Same as uh, Imelda's mum, Sandra, she was uh, from the family of the Riders, from out that way. From Little but, Yeah, Paul, Paul used to say, do you know what? She reminds me of, of, a, of, a, of a family member, Imelda, you know. She, has she got the nose? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the rider nose. <laughs> yeah, uh, and Chico is now developing a very rider nose. Well, it's uh, a, a horseman had it as well, so it's uh, it's in the gene pool, mate, unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you look at it. Chico is like a complete identikit mini version of horseman. Oh, amazing. When, when, oh. Li when Linda saw him last, she burst into yeah. tears because she, he reminded oh, her. Oh, it's like looking at Horseman then, yeah. Oh, bless her. I love I love Sean and Paul's mum. She's ace, isn't she? Yeah, she really. Yeah, is. I feel for her. She, she's had she's had a tough few years, hasn't she? Lost her husband and her bloody son. I know. Not fair, is it? Life. Can you remember where you were when you found out Paul had died? I was, I think, I might have been in Tenerife, you know. Quite, and it's yeah. I know I was there when Den when I found out that Denise had passed as well. So it's uh, oh, just absolutely totally shocking news. A bolt right out of the fucking clear blue. That one, way taken way too early in, in life for me. That it's uh, it ain't fair. You know, it, the guy has probably had so much more to give the world. You know, and we've been denied and cheated of that in a in a lot of ways. You know, and his kids have been cheated of his the fucking dad. You know, and. Music's been cheated of for talent, you know, and, and it's just, it, it, it ain't fair. You know, when that like Grim Reaper's coming for you, he's fucking not leaving empty handed, is he, you know, and uh, couldn't he have picked on someone else that day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think he's still around, like, keeping an eye on Listen, do you know what? There's, there's a saying in uh, in scientific terms that energy can't be destroyed, it mutes, mutates into something else. So he's part of the whole. Great shebang, he's out there without a doubt. Energy has just moved into a, a a different sphere now. You can't see it, but he'll he'll be contributing to the goings on of the planet still. You know, he's out there. Energy his energy will not never be destroyed. That's for sure. It's it's up to us like to 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 keep kindling that energy by listening to his tunes and having a good. Uh, a good memory of him, but you know, when you hear a, a classic Monday song and it's like fucking brilliant now, the man still lives, yeah? Yeah, yeah. 
The other thing that I'm doing is I'm gathering together, like he's written a lot of stuff over the years with various people and I'm gathering all the unreleased material that there is. Yeah. I'm going to put out some music alongside this too. So uh, that'll be Oh, that'd be nice, that, you know, because... It's a, you know, when he was busy, he was busy, man, and he's, and he's a, a, it was a crafter, you know. Um, so that'd be, yeah, that'd be intriguing to see what big arm stuff or whatever else is lurking about there in the, in the vaults, you know. Yeah, well, we've got a whole big arm album that we put out back in the day. You were around for that, weren't you? You... I, I, I can remember when it, when it was coming together for him, yeah. It's like, well, God, it's... It, it, his talent deserves to be seen and not fucking hidden under a bushel because the Mondays had split up and Sean had moved off to do Black Grape or something. So it was good to see him getting busy again, you know. Yeah. Were you around when he was really struggling with drugs? Like, was that, were you part of that time? Probably time? not. I was, I was, I think, around, around that area of time. I was spending half my life in London with the Scream, so... I was always conscious of it, and you know, it's, it's when you get yourself into into that situation, it's it's all consuming, isn't it? And it's it's probably very fucking difficult to get out of it. And uh, yeah. you know, it's uh, addictions. Uh, it's not a nice thing, is it? And when you're in the throes of it, I think all reason goes out the window, doesn't it? And you probably be do things you ordinarily wouldn't do, and. Do you think the music industry is is kind of partly to blame? Like it seems to produce a lot of addicts and a lot of addiction. Do you think that it's be, it, it's a, a? It's not the industry per se. I just think people with addictive personalities are drawn into that world. You know, it's always a a place populated by ne'er do wells and pirates and strange people you know and i think yeah the addictive personality but uh music industry would feed that do you feel like manchester as a city had a part to play in yours and and their success like do you do you fit it was it just a coincidence that you're both from manchester or do you think there's an essence in the city well i i've there, there is something in, in the air here and I, i've always said uh because it pisses with rain a lot in manchester and you're stuck indoors you're either going to take drugs learn to play an instrument or probably do both. So I think geographically, it's probably had its part to play. But there is something in the, in the psyche of Mancunians, like it, it would be like, they won't take no for an answer. If someone says you can't do something, you turn that can't into a can do, you know. And uh, no, we, we, we've got a certain swagger and a certain way of doing things. Uh, and uh, we're good at it, you know, whether it be music, taking drugs, writing books, art, football. Manx have got it covered, man. Do you think that if um, either of you had been in ma with major labels and under the control of a major label, that none of this would have happened? I don't know what to think. I think Factory Records was the perfect home for the Happy Mondays. Uh, they've always been a, 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 quite a, a maverick outfit, you know, and the way of set up or, or the, the bands they have on the roster and the people who run the label. And, and I think that was an absolute marriage made in heaven with Tony and, and, uh, and the Mondays boys. Uh, oftentimes I thought, oh, it would it be Ace of the Roses was on there, uh, on Factory, but I, I some strange reason Tony didn't really take to us. He didn't get it until we did the other side of midnight, and then I think he got it then. But I'm sure Paul and the lads were always going on to Tony about, about us, and yeah, he didn't. He didn't seem to grasp it at first. You know, it took him a while. It was, it was a bit of a slow burner on that one, and I think he then he then realised that he missed a trick possibly. You know, and maybe things might have worked out a lot differently if we'd have been there. But I suppose for us, we, we always had a a worldview was more, and there's more outside of Manchester. You know, you can be you can be trapped by it. I suppose we were always a bit more world conscious, and there's there's a whole world out there outside the 
city limits of Manchester and was always keen to explore that, you know. Yeah. Paul said, I think he says this in the podcast, actually, that at the beginning, Tony thought that you were all goths. He's like, he thought you were... Well, that was a bit, a bit strange. I suppose before I joined them, they, 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 they had a, 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 a different sense of style. Because that's what I loved about the Mondays, was they were all just like scallies, you know. Just like I did from North Manchester, the Adidas trainers and jeans and stuff like that. And I kind of like... I like the look, but uh, at the end of the day, you could have worn a fucking bin liner and still knocked out that beautiful music, and it wouldn't have mattered what genre you were pigeonholed yeah. into, you know. But yeah, but I'm sure Tony did think we was a bit, bit of a gothy band kind of thing. Why would he think you were goths? I mean, Ian and Dark Sort of, they dressed a bit stranger than your your average scowls, The roses are a bit more. They had their own little thing going on there, and I suppose when I joined them, it, it sort of I brought the, the more of the Monday thing to the party kind of thing, but maybe fashion wise or something. I've never held my hands up and take credit for anything like that, but I think I was a bridge to that maybe from from where I'm from, and and you know I'm North Manchester, not far from Salford kind of thing, and proper Manc Union. I suppose I was a, a, a more of a, a bridge stroke link to to the Monday's world, you know, in a way. Yeah, you definitely were. Like, you would, you could have been picked up and put in the Monday's and would not have been out of place. Oh, easily. I'd have, I'd have, you know, I'd have survived and had a whale of a time, no doubt, leading from the front, but... But you couldn't imagine John Squire being picked up and put in the Mondays. That wouldn't have worked, would well, it? Well, it's it, it's a completely different kind of personality. John is, uh, you know, I, I, can, I know how to tickle his funny bone and he's... He sometimes he can be a bit more reserved, John. He's, he's actually... A fucking dirt bag behind you, all, you know, when you when you know the, the level to approach him. But he's a bit more studious and he's very measured, John. And he's he calculates everything and he's everything's worked out, you know, um, to the nth degree, you know. And it's it, it, it's it's everything's got to be right. And he's a bit more of a perfectionist, maybe. Right. did you get into playing the bass? Where did that all come from? Well, I don't know, because I always started out playing uh, guitar, really, in little punk bands when I was when I was younger. And then pre in Spiral Carpets and Roses, I was in a few bands with, with Clint Boone. And he just said, oh, we need someone to play the bass. And I went, well, I'll give it a go, you know. So picked it up and just give it a go and found out I, I quite liked it, you know. Uh, yeah. Seemed to be well suited to it, because I was... I always listen to bass heavy music, whether it be reggae or whether it be Northern Soul or, you know, bits of fucking Funkadelic in Parliament and stuff like that. I don't think it's any uh, strange thing that I've ended up on the four strings, you know. <laughs> Paul always said it was, he preferred it because there were fewer strings, less, 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 less <laughs> to learn. <laughs> yeah, right, right with him on that. But then you've got to rub them less strings in a, in a different different manner to get something out of it. And he was good at it. And I like to think I know what my way around it as well, you know. Of course you do, yeah. Is there like a kind of code? Is there like a, an unwritten code between bass? Like when you meet another bass player, is there like an automatic level of like respect? Like an un, an unseen? Yeah, I think a, a, what it is, I think with bass players is, you're generally not the centre of attention, are you? Like to be a lead guitarist or a singer, they're gonna cop all the fucking, a lot of the adulation and they're right out the pointy end. I think it, the bass players can, can just chill with it a lot more, you know. Uh, you know, listen, even if you're good, and, 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 and I think there's always a spotlight is taken to so, somewhere else in the band. So maybe that's a bit of a pressure off and uh, we generally tend to be a fucking wacky breed and always good for a bit of fun and a bit of a party, you know. Yeah. Is it not like, does it not annoy you sometimes though that other people are getting most of the attention? I was never in the, the game for the, the attention. Is to, it's, I suppose uh, I just like playing, like travelling, like partying. You know, I, I don't think there's such a thing as an ego-less person in a band, but you can have less of an ego, if you know what I mean. Uh, so I always try to have less of an ego, if possible. No doubt I've had my moments, we all do. 
when you're getting smoke blown up your arse of everyone all the time, it's uh, it's easy to let it get to your head, I suppose, a, a little bit. But trying to be as egoless as possible was uh, my thing. You just roll with the punches and enjoy yourself, you know. Thank fuck you've, you're not working in a factory for some twat for 25 quid a week, you know. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> How difficult do you think it was? For, I mean, you were in this position as well. When you have fame thrust upon you virtually overnight at a really young age, like, does that mess with your head? I don't know. I suppose if you're uh, if you're confident in your own abilities, which I'm sure many people in Manchester are, there's a confidence, there's a whole heap of blag as well goes with it. You've got to chuck that front up and... I think we just... You know, if you, if, if some Mancunians broke into NASA, right, they'd, be, they'd have the fucking shuttle doors open within a day. Within a few days, of someone had a fucking word to how to start it. By the end of the week, your mates would be on it and you'd be off for a fucking fly, you know. So there's a, there's a certain can do this with Manchester people. And I think the fame thing, I think we always knew, especially in, in, from, from uh, the Roses part of view, we, we knew the power we had in the, in the power of the four. And we always knew that fame would come. And, but we're not, not really too asked about it. We didn't jump through hoops to chase it. We always knew it would come and find us because we knew in the power of, what we had as a four piece, you know, was supremely confident in what everyone else could bring to the party. Mm -hmm. Were you confident that the Mondays would, would make it as well? Oh, I always knew that Happy Mondays would, would, would do that. I feel like Squirrel and G-Man was a great album, but then when they moved on to Bummed and stuff like that, it was like, they're here. You know, when you get your songs to the calibre of Kinky Afro and, you know, 24 hour party people all the time. Great, great songs done their way. Nothing like it has ever been seen before they invented that style and what have you. And it's, I suppose it's it, it's difficult to be unique. They, they had a, a uniqueness about them, the, the Mondays, that it couldn't have come from anywhere else, you know. Yeah. What did you feel about when the whole Paul Oakenfold, Steve Osborne influence came in and they became like dance dance artists? Where, where? I thought that was great because when we were down recording the first album in London, then myself and Mr Brown would be going out to their clubs. Most of, yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd get our work done in the daytime and then nighttime we'd be going to Spectrum or Land of Oz or Future or Shume. So, so we took to that scene like ducks to water, all of us, you know, um, the E thing and what have you. Then Oakenfold and Osborne have probably used the Mondays as a springboard to get them launched into the production world rather than DJs as well. So it's a very symbiotic relationship. But I always liked and I felt confident that they'd, they'd produce results. Good guys, good guys, and good guys got together, you know. Were you, were you surprised though when it when the whole dance beats were were infused into the records? Well, it's no surprise because it, we were living in the Hacienda and clubs in London, and and we went off the top board into that world, and it's obvious it's going to assimilate itself into your psyche, whether it's by it, 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 it thought thought out or. It's just going to happen. It's going to filter in, without a doubt. Do you think it would have happened without the ease? Did, like, what, what do you think came first, the ease or the music? What? Well, the music was there, but the, but, but the ease enhanced it and took it to another dimension kind of thing, you know. You could not really say a lot of Squirrel and G-Man is dance music. It, that, that was the Mondays being the Mondays and uh, learning, cutting the bones, you know, learning the craft. But then, uh, uh, w w once you get flung together with, with people of the calibre of Oki and Osborne and the power of what the band could produce, it's, it's fucking absolute, it's like high magic. You can't quantify it, it's just dragged out of the air, out of nothing, and it, it's, it's magic. It's right up there. Yeah, yeah. 
one final thing. So just a bit more about Big Arm. Um, so were you surprised when Paul went from being a bass player and being very much in the background to actually being the front man of a band? How did you feel about that? Well, I suppose he was always itching to get out of his brother and Bez's shadow. And then how the fuck Bez has ever managed to become bigger than the musicians in a lot of ways is absolutely beyond me. There's no quantifying that at all. But I'm sure Paul always thought he was... For me, right, he's a very much a driving force in that Happy Mondays. It's, it's very bass-centric. The music revolves around that. I think he he deserved his place in the sun a lot more than he probably got, you know, because he's a very talented lad. Mm. But were you surprised when he decided to sing? Not really. No. He's a talented lad. Why not? If you if, if you want to give it a go, give it a go. You know. Were you ever on the radio? Did you did you have a show? At one I used to have a show on a Monday night at the United Six Point Two, the Revolution. Right. So yeah, that. So you used to, you really supported him when he did, when he had the big arm. Yeah, you noticed because I used to play lots of like local uh, and, and, band, and unsigned stuff and stuff like that. So yeah, I'd, I'd, we'd, we'd give them a push as well. I used to love that, that little radio uh, radio station. Was there. There was a few of us were on there. It was had Clint, shows. Clint had a show as well, didn't he? Yeah, me, Clint, uh, Phil Beckett, he used to DJ at South. Fucking Martin Coogan out in the Mock Turtles, he had a show. Couple of comedians said uh, it, it was brilliant. And what happened to that radio station? Did it got bought out by, I think he was called Steve Penk. He used to be a Piccadilly DJ. And I went in to do my Monday night shift, and someone said, "Here's your playlist," and I've gone, "See ya," because <laughs> when you you, know, you can't put put your own. Like I covered the the breakfast slot uh, a couple of times and playing stuff like smack your bitch up to people going to school, you know, and, and, and go to work, must have fucking freaked a few people out, man. But as soon as it became pl a playlist kind of thing, and it's like, that's all got a bit corporate now. Okay, that's the end of that. Goodbye. Yeah, oh, that's a shame, isn't it? Yeah. Because it was really maverick at the time. I remember it being, like, really unique. Like, everybody's... Oh, we always used to have, like, a local unsigned bands or up and coming bands and they'd come in and they might do an acoustic in the studio with you or so we yeah. we, we, we give a, a, a few bands a push like Arctic Monkeys is coming and do stuff before they'd started kicking off and yeah I'd forgotten but I remember going in with Paul to your yeah. show and you did an yeah. interview with him and, and you were really supportive of Big Arm I remember. no no if it was his mate you know of course you're going to support him yeah and, 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 yes. To give him as much of a hand as you could, you know. Did you like the music? Did, were you surprised at the... Yeah, it was good. It was, it, it was different again, you know. Just try something newer. It could have been easier to come out with the Monday's Mark too, but then he's not challenging himself then, is he, if he'd have done that? I think it was all more about where he could take it to some somewhere different, maybe. Which is, which is great. It's, you, you can sit on your laurels and, and say nothing and... And, and, and nick a career if, if you so choose, but that's not yeah. that's not the way of uh, the way of the Mancunian, is it? Yeah. So what do you think? Finally, what do you think his legacy is going to be like? What what's what's he left behind? Well, I think he's he's left behind it as a body of work and a some some absolutely timeless cracking. You know, you listen to Kinky Afro, Ralph for Luck, da, 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 all this these days. Maybe same as the Rose LP. For some strange reason, they don't sound dated. They they, they caught a, a, a freshness and a vibe, which has not been really been emulated. And it's it's timeless music. And as a bass player, I fucking admired Paul's bass playing so much. He he was he had the funk, you know. It was he, he had that Boosie Collins thing. But he had the, for the white guy. He was a very funky white guy, you know. Thank you so much, Manny. I'll talk to you soon. Lots of love. That's all we've got for you this week. Please join us again next week, same time, same place, for yet another very special bonus episode. 
Lots and lots of love and thanks to Manny for being a really great guy and for giving us his time and giving us the interview. Really huge condolences as well on the loss of his lovely, lovely wife Imelda, who I really did consider to be a really lovely friend. Lots and lots of love to all of you. Please go to the website, paulrider.tv, where you'll find lots of information about all the things to do with the show. Love to all of you, and of course, lots of love and thanks to the man himself, the late, great Paul Anthony Wright. Do you think I'd lay you down to die? I'm coming for you on my white charger, and you don't know the reason why. I'm coming for you on an Appaloosa. Do you think I'd lay you down to die? I'll take you for a ride. I'll have you by my side. We'll go for a drive on my electric light. I'll take you for a ride. I'll have you by my side. This is a life.